Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Hello there, Duke fans, and welcome to episode number 565 of the Duke Basketball Roundup. It is Sunday, December 3rd, 2023, and for the first time, we get to talk about a winless week for Duke basketball. We are not happy about that, but that's what we are we are here to do on the Duke Basketball Roundup. Before we get into yesterday's game at Georgia Tech, my name is Donald Wine. I am your host for this episode I have the resident ATLE and Jason Evans, who was at the game yesterday. Jason, hello, good morning. I know it's been a a struggle of a morning for both of us because we just don't like waking up after Duke basketball losses. No, no, I had a I had a very very busy day, and uh, the Duke game was smack dab right in the middle of it. Uh, yeah, it's 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 super frustrating. It's no fun to to, to go into an to a foreign stadium and and watch this uh, this team lose, especially. The way they play, there, there, there are lots of concerns, Donald, that our our listeners definitely responded to. <laughs> yeah, well, before we get into everything about the game, let's start with you at the game. I, I know a few people other than yourself who uh, were at McCamish Pavilion yesterday for the game. It seemed like there was a lot of Duke fans in the building, but tell us what the scene was like uh, at the game, not just from the Duke perspective, but the overall crowd. So uh, I'll tell you, it was kind of funny. Uh, I'm used to, I've, I've obviously been to, to Duke Tech games in Atlanta many, many times over the years. And unless it's a year where Georgia Tech is really expected to be pretty good, the the, the crowd is almost always at least 30%, sometimes as much as 40, 45% Duke fans. There are a lot of Duke fans in Atlanta. If you, <laughs> if you Donald, you and I were recently looking at, at where the DBR podcast gets most of our listenership from, and Atlanta is like one of the top cities in the in the country for sure. That said, I do want to tip my cap a little bit to the tech crowd. They were a bit more rowdy, a bit louder than they usually are. And there were moments in the second half when this game was getting very tense, where the tech crowd was most assuredly out cheering and, you know, more intense than the Duke fans that were there. And that's, that's not that shocking considering the tech crowd is made up mostly of students and the Duke fans are mostly like me, older alums, but, but that said, it's still, you know, it's still worth mentioning that uh, Damon Stoudemire has brought uh, a little bit of atmosphere back to back to that stadium. And, and that's a, you know, again, that's a hat tip to the Georgia Tech crowd. Uh, there were there were a couple interesting things I noticed that you would not have seen on the broadcast. Most significantly, and, and I'm not saying that this is something that carried over to the game, but it was just kind of interesting for me to note this during the warm ups. The Georgia Tech guys, you know, both teams come out at the same time and they're doing you know, in theory, what we call the layup line, but no one's Mm -hmm. taking layups that much. Uh, I was watching the Georgia Tech guys. They were taking like crazy thunder dunks, like putting on a show in a way that would never, ever, ever happen in a game. We're talking about like one dude tossed the ball in the air and dunked it off the bounce. Uh, You know, this was like amateur slam dunk contest kind of stuff. And it's kind of entertaining. I mean, I didn't hear the crowd really ooing and eyeing that much to it. Maybe they were doing it for themselves or whatever, but that's what was going on at one end of the floor. And then I looked at the other end of the floor to say that Duke was all business, like doesn't even cover it. Like Sean Stewart practicing his free throws. Uh, McCain and Proctor are like shooting mid range jumper and then going out to the three point line, like in a very pattern kind of way. Like this was this, it, it, it was just night and day. Uh, Ryan Young was in the post making moves against Stanley Borden 
and Christian Reeves, you know, working on his his old man game, so to speak. The 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 stark difference in the way the two teams. This is the final five minutes before the game's going to start. Georgia Tech's doing windmill dunks at one end, and and Duke is literally working on stuff that you know is, you know, absolutely essential for the game at the other end. Now, look, the game started in and throw that stuff out the window. Duke starts horrible and Tech starts great. And and I'm not saying that any of this has anything to do with how the game turned out. But to me, it was an interesting contrast just in how the two teams, you know, the attitudes. Maybe maybe you could say Tech was more loose and, and Duke was more business, you know, and maybe that's a criticism. Maybe that's a problem. I don't know. It's just something I observed that I thought was interesting. And then the last little note, Donald, that I had of like observations from being there and watching the game and and watching things that you don't get to see, there was a timeout for Duke. It was in the first half. There was a timeout, and just the way the team huddled up, somehow Spencer Hubbard found himself standing in between Stanley Borden and Christian Reeves, and he basically, <laughs> like, he didn't even go up to their armpits. <laughs> it was That sounds about right. Yeah, it was just, it, I, like, I couldn't help but take a note on it. It was very amusing. You know, Jason, I, I've been down to uh, Georgia Tech for a game before uh, against Duke a few years back, and when you have a new coach, this is when Josh Pat- Passner was still the coach. So when you have a new coach, sometimes they like to put their immediate stamp on the program by switching around uh, where people sit. You may they bring some students closer. They may move some of the big wigs back. Now, it felt like from what I saw on on TV and highlights that there were a few more students in the building. Was that do you think that's more of a one off thing because this was a Duke game or is that something that David Stoner has put an emphasis on of of getting more of those students down so that they can make, you know, like a Cameron crazy effect on the game? Yeah, and I did notice that they like the students used to be at the two end zones at Georgia right. Tech. Right. And they they had um, it was about maybe three or four rows of students right along um, uh, courtside. Uh, you know, opposite the two benches. I, I don't know. It, it did not create a Cameron kind of effect. There's no question about that. And the the students, it wasn't as coordinated. It wasn't as loud a, as it is at Cameron. I, I don't know whether that's a Damon Sotomayor thing. I don't know whether that's something that they do for other games um, or if they're only going to do it for for Duke and really high profile opponents. But but you're you're correct. It was a change from what we've seen from them in the past. Yeah, and it, again, it wasn't a, a noticeable effect on like the noise level, you know, at least from the TV's perspective. But it was a visual that, of course, we see this at stadiums all across country, not just Cameron, right, where students have started to been, you know, be, you know, coming closer to the floor so that they can try to replicate the Cameron experience. Of course, no one can, but at least that idea is to get the students closer to the court. Maybe that has a profound effect on whatever game those intangibles when we're talking about one or two points hey maybe those students can get one or two points for you but jason we'll talk more about you being at the game a little bit later let's get into the actual game and we're going to start with the headlines and jason we got a, a ton of headlines uh i don't know if you saw it i know you were you were at the game but they started rolling in maybe with about three minutes left in the game and with the game still in doubt uh but we had a ton of of emails thank you to everybody who sent headlines again DBR podcast at gmail.com if you would like to send a headline in for a game. But let's, I'm going to give you some that I thought were, you know, kind of describe the game. And then you can chime in with some that you, that you have. First off, Jason or Josh Levinson, great, great person. He always emails us. He had Devils doused in Stoudemire debut. Thought that was pretty, pretty poignant and simple. David Garay, uh, wrecked, wreck, Rex, wrecked Devils. That is a, I can't even do that twice. I'm not going to, but that was a good one. I like the alliteration. I like the rhyme. I like the tongue twister. David Gray, thank you very much. Jared Strauss, Duke looks lost in the swarm. I thought that's something we'll we'll talk about a little bit later, but I thought that was something that really described how this game went. Of course, uh, Jim Baum, Baumgartner, he <laughs> he gave us a, a line that a lot of people sent in. Uh, tech for taunting turns tied for tech. That technical foul against Mark Mitchell. Uh, even John Shire talks about it in the post game as it being a changing point in, or at least a pivotal moment in that game. I, don't, I won't say it's a changing point, but it was definitely a pivotal moment in that game. Ken Swanner. Uh, Wait, hey, had, hey, Donald. Yeah, I'll, go ahead. I'll say it was a changing point. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, changing point, pivotal moment, whatever you want to call yeah. it. It was it was something that it was definitely definitely marked. Uh, as We're going to talk, talk about, about. it. We're going to talk about it. Um, Ken Swanner. Blue Devils never find ointment to overcome early sting by jackets. That one was a really good one. And then Jason, we got a lot of emails 
that sim that, that are summed up by this one by John Grantland, and it's very simple. We're in trouble. Uh, so what what do you have from from this game that you thought described what happened on the floor? I mean, I, I don't have a specific headline. I think that, you know, let's we, we should probably just get to the the good and the bad and the such as a way of discussing this game. I, I will I will tell you as a preview because I know it, it you know it may take a little while until we get to the back half of this podcast and and we get to the bad, which is which is where I'm going to bring out the most important thing. But the thing I'm going to focus on, Donald when the time comes is going to be assists because I think the overall thing that I got from this game is that Georgia tech made life easy on themselves and Duke made life difficult on themselves. And mm-hmm. this wasn't a one game thing. This is some, this is a pattern that has been developing for a while. And we're going to talk more about that later on, but let's, let's start with the good. Cause that's not something that's good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and before I, I get to the good, I, I'm going to lead with the good with this. We're going to talk about individual players but I want to start with the bench because Jason, a minute in what 16 seconds into the game, yeah. Tyrese Proctor goes down with an injured ankle. He does not return to the game. And it it's one of those things where you have to figure out how to respond in that moment. And I think the bench filling in for Tyrese Proctor in the minutes that he would have provided, I thought did a great job. 28 points from our bench. They, you know, the bench out, you know, outpaced Georgia Tech's bench. But I want to shout out them as in general. Because I think when a guy goes down, you need not just the next man to, stay, to stand back up, but you need a bunch of guys to stand back up. And and I thought the bench as a whole provided the scoring output. I mean, 28 points. We're usually not getting 28 points, Jason, from our bench. We're usually in the teens maybe. But to get that sort of output from them in production, I thought was really good. Well, the thing about the bench that you have to note is that this becomes a incredibly weird bench game for two reasons, both obviously Tyrese Proctor going down which results in Caleb Foster playing almost 36 minutes in this game. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, essentially he, he becomes the starting point guard and plays, plays even more than a regular starting point guard would because there was no backup point guard. (laughs) Right. Uh, So that's going to impact bench stuff. And then the other thing is, and, and this, this sort of rippled through press row about 15 minutes or so before game time, the fact that Ryan Young was in the starting lineup and Mark Mitchell was not, Um, which I think, you know, a lot of people have talked about Mitchell's play has not been there in recent games. And, uh, you know, I think it was entirely warranted that that Duke would make this kind of a change, uh, you know, give Mark a a little bit of time to 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 see things developing off the bench before he comes in and begins to play. And I thought Mitchell had some some pretty nice moments in this game. Um, You know, there's there was a really quirky. Because, well. Uh, like Mark Mitchell was fine. It wasn't, it wasn't nearly as poor a game, I think, as he's had in recent days, uh, re- you know, recent weeks, I guess. Uh, but for some reason, the plus minus, you just see the plus minus this game for Mark Mitchell. Mm-hmm. He's plus 17 in a game that Duke loses. He was plus 17 for his and TJ you know, power was plus 11. Those were the two guys who got, I mean, uh, we, we again say plus minus is not really the best indicator to talk about it from game to game, but those two guys off the bench had the best plus minus of anybody on the team. Yeah. 17 and 11. And then boy, uh, Jared McCain was minus 18 in his 20 minutes of play. It was a rough, rough game for Jared. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think Jason, we'll go to, you know, a couple before again, it's to one guy that I thought played really well. Again, talking about the team, the team, struggled during this game but they fought back and and just like against arkansas they didn't quit they got i mean we had a point where we took the lead you know very late in the game and it was on the back of turnovers we first 12 turnovers and got 17 points off of those turnovers and offensive rebounds when we did miss shots then we missed a lot of shots we got 13 offensive rebounds and that led to 17 second chance points so i think that run that it, where we slowly but surely tried to claw our way back into the game and then eventually take the lead briefly. It was based off of some of those two things, getting turnovers and turning those into points to the other end and also getting those offensive rebounds and turning those into points or going to the free throw line to get points from, you know, off of fouls. So uh, again, we hate being in the position where we have to come from behind, but I like the fight in this team to claw back and make sure that they let the other team know that there's going to be no quit. And in, in these games that we've had that we've lost, we're five and three in the season. The three losses we've had, we were down. We somehow figured out a way to claw back. We just were. We just fell short. 
Yeah, I mean, look, you're you're talking, uh, you know, about about bench stuff and about offensive boards and efforts. Uh, we, we should mention certainly the good that TJ Power got his earliest and most significant minutes of the year that he buried a three at one point. You know, which is something very very few other players on this on this team did in this game. Uh, it was not a good outside shooting game for Duke, but TJ Power was able to to contribute and help with that. But you were you were briefly talking a little bit about some of the rebounding. I thought that Ryan Young and Kyle Filipowski were doing a really good job of battling on the offensive boards. Um, you know, Duke won the second chance points, thirteen nothing, and I, I think even when they weren't getting offensive rebounds, they were keeping balls alive. And I just you know I was at a great vantage point the way. Georgia Tech puts the the press. It's you know we're mostly upstairs. I was actually at a really great vantage point, especially in the second half, to see the Duke basket. It was like directly underneath me, and and I I, I saw these guys fighting hard. Any notion? Look, Duke is struggling right now. We we had you know arguably the worst week that Duke has had. Duke sports has had in a while, in a long time. Basketball team loses two games. Football team loses its coach. It was a really really rough week for Duke sports. But it was not because there was no effort. There, there are a lot of things that people have said about this Duke basketball team, and and it struggles at the moment. I, I, I do not think that what we're seeing is a function of of effort, um, because I was really able to observe that in this game, and 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 they did keep fighting, especially underneath for the offensive rebounds. And Jason, I think the other thing is last year a lot of our struggles came because we had sloppy play in the form of turnovers. That's not been the case this year either. You know, we were under 10 turnovers this year. And in the, in the stat that we had last year, it was like, hey, if, if we have less than 12 turnovers, we're winning this ball game. That happened nine, you know, 99 times out of 100. And this year, it seems like these games, I think the Arizona game, we had we had a lot of turnovers. But other than that, we've been very good at about taking care of the basketball. It's just that we're not making shots. And we're and there's other things that are, that are adding to that. I, I want to go back to the good, um, because I think there's two players we want to talk about first. Give me your thoughts on Jeremy Roach, because, again, Jeremy Roach with 20 points, another 20-point output this week. Uh, spoiler alert, he's my player of the week because he's the one that got 20 points in both games. But, again, there was a lot of times where he decided the ball was his and he needed to take over this ball game. Yeah, on a day where Duke struggled to have any offensive cohesion at all, Jeremy Roach took the reins and was making stuff happen. He played all 40 minutes. I think he was the focal point of the offense. <laughs> In about 38 of those 40 minutes or something like that. Um, he ran, especially late in the game, they just started when, you know, nothing else was working. So they were like, just let's just run pick and roll action with Kyle and, and Jeremy. Like that was our only play. And and it was actually pretty effective. Um, he hit his free throws and his threes, something no one else on the team did. I mean, Jeremy Roach, uh, you know, Jeremy Roach is two of three on three pointers, six of seven for the free throw line. I happened to look, I subtracted that. It was like, how'd the rest of the team do? How'd the non-Jeremy Roach players do? So the rest of the team was two of 13 from three-point range and six of 13 from the free throw line. For that, for the folks who can't do math, six of 13, Duke shot less than 50% on free throws if you were not named Jeremy Roach. So you gotta gotta tip your cap to the senior captain who, in a game where we could not shoot straight, we could not figure out how to get easy buckets, he said, okay, I'm just going to take this on my own shoulders. And for the most part, he was able to get it done. Uh, You know, I know a lot of people were sort of like, oh, we got all these great freshman guards coming in. Uh, Sorry, senior Jeremy Roach is the best guy to have the ball in his hands, at least right now for Duke. Hey, that minutes per game uh, stat that we have in the stat game looking mighty nice right now. Uh, We got a nice little buffer. Uh, I believe he only sat out for two minutes and two seconds this week. So, uh, the man, the man needs a needs an ice bath. Jason, the other guy uh, that I thought, you know, again, didn't play a lot of stretches of game, but when he's in there, that man is everywhere. His name is Jalen Blakes. Talk to me about what you saw from Jalen Blakes in this game, because especially in the defensive end, like again, sometimes what he does is not statable. It's not going to appear on a stat sheet, but he affects the game with his energy, with his bounce, and again with his defense. You know, it's it's tough because. I mean, I, I look, I fall victim to it. Sometimes when I'm talking about the team and thinking about depth and talking about options and things like that, I, I forget about Jalen Blakes. 
And I feel terrible about that. I know I, that hey, I do. I, we all do. It's not, it's, it's no shame. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like he's like, yeah, please doubt me. This, this is, this is what I want because then he flies on a radar. It makes this every, almost feels like every game go, man, Jalen Blake's when he was in the game, he's doing something. Yeah. And, and it's not, look, he's not going to be an impact on offense. He had, he had back-to-back mm-hmm. possessions where he took corner threes. I was like, we really don't need Jalen. That's not the shot. Yeah. Th- it's just not his game. There are a couple of times he took the ball to the bucket and, and got snuffed by, by the block party that was happening from Georgia Tech. But his disruption on defense cannot be measured in steals, field goal percentage, or anything like that. It's measured in how much he makes the opposing team work and and the pressure he puts on their guards. Like, I, I fully believe that when Jalen Blakes is in the game, the other team just doesn't get as good shots as they as they do when he's not in the game. Half this game is played on offense, but half of it's played on defense. And we tend to focus on the offense a lot more than the defense. And there's absolutely no question. Jalen Blakes is an elite, elite defender. And in this game, man, whoever was guarding, whoever he was guarding was just not having fun. <laughs> I could see it out there. Like there are a couple of times the Georgia Tech point guard would see Blakes out of it. He just let me like, you know, raise his hand and like call one of his buddies over. He's like, you take it. I don't want to deal with this guy. You take it. Jalen Blake's ability to be a disruptor is special. And uh, for a team that was struggling on defense a lot, he is a spark. He, he is a really valuable part of the line. He'll never be appreciated enough. He'll never get the headlines. He'll never get the big NIL dollars or any of that other kind of stuff. And and his career will probably be over when, when he's done playing ball. He, he probably doesn't have a career at the next level. But that doesn't matter because Jalen Blake's still impacts games when he's in there. He deserves, I mean, I'm sitting here telling you that I forget about it. He deserves so much more respect than he gets for his play. I think disruptor is the best way to describe his game, right? Especially again on the defensive end. Again, he's not gonna he's not gonna grab 18 rebounds or block 18 shots, but you, you we were talking before the game or before this before the show about how he had that chase down block, uh, which is again, it's like one thing that you're not expecting him it was to do. outrageous, but he realized that he needed we needed that at that moment and he was able to provide it. Sometimes it's just being in someone's face so that they don't get the ball, right? Like some, we, 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 we don't value all, all the time. Those defenders we do in football, right? Like we had Revis Island where everyone's like, Oh man, when, when Revis was in the game, no one ever threw the ball his way because they knew if they did, it was going the other way for six in basketball. We never appreciate that where someone is so, so much of a disruptor. It disrupts the flow of the offense because you can't get the guy the ball that you want to have the ball because he's so in their face. And I think that is a non statable thing that he likes to do when he's in the game. And again, he, he's, he's only played close to what just less than nine minutes in this game, but he was able to disrupt the Georgia tech offense. And when you disrupt the offense, that leads to them making bad decisions. That leads to turnovers. It leads to bad shots. It leads to us going the other way and hopefully making points out of it. Yeah, I, I I don't have much. I, I thought I had something else I was going to add, but then I changed my mind. <laughs> I Shout out Jalen Blakes. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I think we're I think we're uh, you know unless you got something else, I'm I'm kind of done with the good. Uh, you know, there were a couple guys who had flurries. Caleb Foster had a little flurry in the first half. That was it was I think he had like six points in a row. That was pretty nice. Uh, Mark Mitchell, I think we may have mentioned this already. Had had a little flurry late in the game where he was the key outlet valve, uh, and 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 had a couple big plays. One of which led to a bad play, and we'll get to that later. But but for the most part, this is not a game where there's a lot of good to talk about for Duke. Even if we'd managed to pull this out down the stretch, it would be a game where there's more concerns than there are cheers, so to speak. Yeah, and we're going to get to those concerns. But first, let's take a quick break. Again, on the other side, we'll talk about the bad. We'll talk about the play of the game, and we will give out player of the week honors. Stick around. Because we Yo, and Donald, we're also hey, we're also going to hear. I was in the locker room. Well, I was in the, right next to the locker room. Going to hear exclusive sound of my interview with Duke players after the game. After this, listen to Jason. Listen to talk somebody else talk about Duke. Back after this. All right, we are back. And before we get into the bad, and I know we have a lot to talk about in the bad. 
we keep pushing and kicking the can down the road, so to speak. But it's for good reason, because, again, Jason Evans was in the building. And afterwards, he was able to participate in some of the post-game uh, interviews and get some audio from some of the guys. So, Jason, talk about who you who you talked to. I know Jeremy Roach and John Shire faced the media and answer some questions. Tell us what you what you heard uh, from those two guys. Yeah, so it was sort of an interesting situation. There were a few reporters that went down. We went down to the Duke locker room to try and get in and, and chat with the players a little bit. Uh, look, in the post-COVID era, different teams, different arenas do things and in, in different ways. Um, sometimes you get into the locker room, you can talk to anyone you want. Sometimes they bring a few players out. Sometimes they bring them up to a microphone. Sometimes they just let reporters talk to them. Uh, I think because Duke lost, this was a game where they didn't want reporters to be exposed to the entire team. Uh, I'll, I'll frankly say that I think they did not want Mark Mitchell to have to talk to reporters about about his technical foul with with two minutes and 20 seconds left. So what happened was we were standing outside the locker room and they said, no, you guys, we're not going to let you in, but we'll bring out a player for you to talk to. And that player was Jeremy Roach. So you're about to hear Steve Wiseman, uh, who's the fine reporter for the News and Observer who covers Duke. Steve and I both asked questions to Jeremy Roach, who was the player that they brought out. And and you'll hear that. And then we're going to go ahead and play a little bit of John Shire talking about what happened in the game. Um, and both Steve and I asked questions to John Shire as well. So let's, let's play that sound. What, what was going on defensively early that allowed them to get so many open three-pointers? And how do you guys fix that? Uh, we're just not doing what we talked about in practice. I mean, there's no carryover. I mean, we said we're not going to give up any threes in transition. We're not going to give up any three to, to Kelly. Um, I mean, give, give credit to Georgia Tech. They came out with fire. So we just got to do better in a week of practice. Jeremy, can you talk about the last play? Was that what you guys drew up? I mean, you and Kyle have been running lots of pick and roll kind of action. Yeah. I mean, I got the ball, three people running at me at one time, and it was kind of uh, kind of difficult to get out that corner, but um, I should have made, it, made a better play. But uh, it's on us at the end of the day. We ain't coming down with some crucial stops, and we got a technical when we were up four, getting two, two easy free throws, and then they got another score. That's a four-point swing right there. So just mental areas and stuff like that we got to fix, though. So. You know, we have a week of practice. We got to stick together. We got to get together even closer. And as a coaching staff, we got to get together. There are some things we have to look at and probably make some changes. But the biggest thing is really sticking together, being together on offense. You know, I haven't liked the way we shared the ball the last two games. You know, we have 11 assists. Uh, we have a team, I believe, should have closer to 20 assists a game. You know, we should just, it should come easier for us. But for me, it was our defense. Like when we needed key stops, we didn't get them. Uh, credit Georgia Tech. They were ready to play. They were they were ready to go, man. They did a great job. Uh, and uh, we didn't do enough. So, you know, I'll take any questions. And uh, But disappointing. You know, it's a disappointing loss. And uh, it's something that we have to learn from. You have 6662. Please, please get a microphone. Yeah, you go up by four and Mark's dunk, and then he gets the technical foul on that play. What did you see on that play? What did the officials tell you? What, what's your reaction to that? Well, obviously, it's a big play. I mean, you know, we're clawing our way back, and Mark has two big finishes, and that's the thing he hasn't done I've wanted him to do. And he has two big time dunks. Um, I don't want to comment without seeing the play. You know, I, I didn't see what happened afterwards. They told me it was taunting and it was clear. Like, there's no arguing it, there's no defense, there's pointed and said something um but if that's the case he can't do that but I, I can't say that he did because I haven't I haven't seen that play yet and you don't need me to tell you that's a big play in the game you're up two possessions and you get one stop you're in a great position instead he Kelly hits the two free throws and then they tie it right away I mean it's a huge play and um you know it's uh it's a big play John, you talked about needing to share the ball better. Your opponents have been sharing the ball incredibly well. Uh, last game against Arkansas, they had 16 assists on like 26 baskets. Today it's like 17 or 18 assists on 27 made baskets. What, what is it you're not seeing happening on defense that's giving teams easier shots than I know you'd like to see them take? Well, there's a – like part of it is there's a, there's a certain uh, – attention to detail you have to have right away you know like I could go through the first three threes and how we got them and we didn't do 
what we talked about doing. But also, there's just a competitive edge you have to have. You know, we did a good job overall with them on the offensive boards. They had six, we had 13. But still, there's too many plays. The shot goes up, we're turning and looking. We have to hit and we call it hit and get. You know, on on the ball screens, um, we're not in on the ball the way we need to be. We're not, it's just, it's all the attention to detail. I can go through, like I can go through it all with you. But uh, it's not on the level it should be, bottom line. And for us, that's what we have to get back to this week in practice. And, you know, it's, it's hard when you outshoot a team by nine. We got nine more shots. We have seven more free throws. You know, we, we missed some easy ones. But our defense should have put us in a better position, and uh, it didn't. So, Donna, what you just heard from Jeremy Roach and John Shire leads us very nicely into – the thing that I want to start our, our discussion of the bad about, and that's mm-hmm. specifically assists. You heard me ask the question to John Shire, and uh, and I'll be honest, John kind of, uh, look, it, it's tough in the moment. Uh, I don't want to say he ducked my question, but his answer didn't really jive with, with the point I was trying to make. So I'm going to go ahead and make that point for everybody again, and it's this. Uh, the most important thing happening with this team right now is – Duke not getting assists on offense and giving up assists on defense. Now that sounds simplistic, but that that is a uh, effect, uh, a symptom, so to speak, of of a larger disease. And the disease is that Duke makes life hard on itself and makes life easy for their opponent. By that I mean Duke is going one on one too much. Duke is not sharing the ball enough. And as a result, we're taking difficult shots. We have incredibly talented ball players, guys who are going to be playing basketball for a professional living for many, many years. But they are mostly going one-on-one. And our opponents are moving the ball around phenomenally. And Duke is not doing very much to stop them from doing that. And as a result, our opponents are getting easier shots than we are. That's the major point that I was trying to make to John Shire. Your opponents are getting a ton of assists, and your team, frankly, is not. And I'm going to give you a few numbers. So at one point in the first half, I was looking at the box score. Georgia Tech had eight baskets and had eight assists. Now, I'm not talking – this wasn't early. It wasn't until the six-minute mark of the first half that Tech finally scored a bucket that wasn't off an assist. And to be clear, these assists are leading to – By definition, an assist means you made an easier bucket for your teammate. Your teammate didn't have to work to get that shot. You got it for him with your pass. Again and again and again, we saw Georgia Tech taking the ball to the hole and making the extra pass. While at the other end of the court, Duke has Kyle Flopowski and Jeremy Roach trying to do stuff against triple teams in traffic. it's It's the biggest problem facing this team right now. Jason, I, I, you know, I love this stat because it's something that we tracked last year. I think it's indicative of how the ball ball movement is in a team. I knew you were going to do it. Go for it, man. (laughs) When when you talk about, you mentioned that in the first eight baskets for Georgia Tech, they had eight assists. I, I was, you know, keeping track of the uh, game tracker, and I believe in the first ten baskets that they made, Georgia Tech had nine assists. In our first ten baskets made, we had two assists. Yeah, that's a stark difference in how the game is. And everyone who wrote in, you know, everyone who wrote in about, you know, what this team, what's wrong with the team and, and what's going on. A lot of them point to the fact that just like you said, we are not moving the ball around like we traditionally do, like as a Duke program, like we traditionally have guys who are great at making that extra pass to find that open man, whether it's for a three pointer or for a dunk or for a lay in. We're taking guys off the dribble and it's not one on one. It's one on five. Do you know how I know that? Because I look at the stats and I see that this week, Duke took 129 shots and 18 of them were blocked. That is 14%. That is a huge rate. We are taking guys one on five and we're not. And because of that, when we get blocked, we're not getting second chance points. Very rarely does that ball end up in the hands of a Duke player. It goes the other way, and a lot of times it ends up with points for the other team, and there you go. There's your five-point swing or four-point swing. The problem is is we are not we are taking guys. It's almost like an NBA style of offense where one guy brings the ball up. We may do a pass around the uh, perimeter. 
uh, or, or when I say pass is really just we're driving, we're, we're basically dribbling towards a guy on the wing, handing the ball off to him. Yeah, we do a handoff, setting, handoff using it as a pick um, yeah. in the hopes that no one follows him. But everyone sees that they're doing that. And also they see that when someone comes around that curl, they're not going to the basket anyway. They're just going towards the top of the key to kind of reset the offense. So it becomes stagnant. And at a certain point, one of the guards takes the ball or, or we pass it into flip or somebody and they just go to the basket and there's no passing. There's no, uh, no way to free up again. Like you said, to create a better shot. We have not been good at doing that. That is not what we expected this team to be like, what they're playing like right now from a ball movement perspective, because we have, as you mentioned, you know, we're, we're not taking great shots all the time. We're taking a lot of contested shots and everything we're missing. Uh, Dom, everything's contested. It's yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> and it's, it's different than like last year we had times where we were moving the ball around great and we were missing open shots. We're missing contested shots this year because we're not, we're not moving the ball around enough to create those open looks that are, are going to be better. Right. Like it's just statistically, it, it's just a statistical thing, right? Like if you have an open shot, you were going to make it more times than if there's a hand in your face. And we need to figure out what we are doing wrong and and try to try to flip it so that we have more shots where there's nobody in our face because statistically, we're going to make a lot more of them. That assist number will go up. But right now, it just feels like the offense stagnates for too many long stretches of this of, of a basketball game. And you can't do that against the good teams. And as we figured out yesterday, even the teams that people think are mediocre, you can't do it against them either. Yeah, uh, look, it, the offense is broken. There's no other way to say that. There's no question that the offense is broken. Mm-hmm. And, and, and by the way, the defense is broken too. You you gave the stat about the blocks, which is an incredible I, – I wish I'd looked that up, man. That is an incredible stat that Duke's getting blocked, you know, that high percentage this week. I'll give you another stat from this week. So Tech, in the, in the game yesterday, assisted on 19 out of 27 buckets. 70%. Better than 70% of their baskets were assisted. Duke, on the other hand – only assisted out of 11 out of 26. That's 42%. And by the way, that number was way worse until we had a flurry in the final five minutes the where, mm-hmm. yeah, where where Flip and Roach both started to find teammates for uh, for dunks and, and, and for buckets. They especially found Mark Mitchell a couple. But so Duke's number was 42%, but it really wasn't that high throughout most of the game. Against Arkansas, exact same story. Arkansas assisted on 17 out of 26 buckets. That's better than 65%. And Duke was 10 of 24 for only 41%. And look, there's no better way to see this than the final minute of the game. Tie ball game, final minute. Georgia Tech's going down, tossing lobs for dunks. That's a high percentage shot, Donald. They did L-U's. that. Like on back, yeah, back-to-back if you possessions. Look at, if, Jason, if you look at the, like ESPN has like the highlights from the game, like four of the five of them are alley-oops from, for Georgia Tech. Yeah, we should be having none of them, but we have four. It was like four different videos, and I thought they were the same video. That's like how 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 closely aligned they were, and and two of them in the final minute, while Duke is coming down the other end, and like I said earlier, you know, Flip and Roach are trying to fight off triple teams to try and get up a shot. <laughs> if you tell me I'm I'm shooting, if you tell me I'm taking a, a an open dunk on an alley oop, or I'm taking a shot against a double team or a triple team. I know which is the better offensive plan, and it's not mm-hmm. the one that Duke has has been executing lately. It's, I think, it's one of the more frustrating parts of the season, right? Like the fact that we thought the offense was going to far outpace our defense, and so far our offense is not pacing anything. It it, it seems oh, it's not like our defense is great, by the way. <laughs> right, right, but it's it's it it feels so inefficient, and even early in the season when you know it seemed like things were falling and and, and all of that, I I think the the offense again stems from the fact of our bread and butter is finding making it so easy that everyone just goes man like Duke is finding every basket every single time, or again even if we're in those positions, we're breaking guys down and we're getting to the basket and we're making, we're getting to the free throw line, which we have been doing. We have been getting to the free throw line, but we rely on that way too much because you're not going to get a, a, you know, in football, there's holding on every single play, but they don't call holding on every single play in basketball. When you go to the rack, you were not going to get every single call. So you can't rely on it. You have to be able to put yourself in a position where you don't have to rely on getting to the free throw line 
to make your make your shots. You have to rely on finding the open man to make that basket as easy as possible. You you don't want contested dunks. You don't want contested threes. You want uncontested dunks and layups. You want uncontested shots. And to do that, you have to pass the ball. The ball will always move faster than a human being. Yeah, and uh, it, you're talking about contested versus uncontested. One of the problems for Duke yesterday was even the uncontested shots didn't oh, were falling. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and that's just confidence. Like that. Just I mean, sometimes that happens, but that's also been a pattern. We we missed contested ones, and because of that, we don't have the confidence to make the the uh, to make those uh, you know ones that are wide open. Yeah, I mean, we're the gang that that could not shoot straight, and 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 also it just feels like, you know, all these teams have guys who you don't expect to, to be like when we do the preview, guys who are not major factors in the preview or where you go, Oh, that's the guy you can let shoot. And they, they suddenly turn around and have a game against Duke that they just haven't had. Like uh, Kawasi Reeves was five of 17 on three pointers coming into this game for Georgia tech Reeves five of 17, like, you know, less than 30% on three pointers. He goes four for four. His first, he was, he was four for five in the game, but he hit his first four, three pointers against Duke, a dude who's hitting less than 30% suddenly hits four out of four, three pointers against you. And meanwhile, At the other end, I mean, like, there was one play with 11 minutes to go in the second half. We got an offensive rebound, and Jared McCain was wide open for a straight-on three. He could not have seen that shot any better than he he did, and it missed. I mean, I bet he makes that shot, like, 75% ordinarily as open as he would. And and Tech, by the way, raced to the other end, and Debo Coleman got a three-point play. He had a tough runner where he got whacked. I was like, man, that just sums up the game that, like, Wide open three for Jared McCain, and and it didn't happen for me. By the way, I want to mention just real quick side side note. I met Jared McCain's mom. We were walking. I was walking into the stadium, and we we're about to you know we we're at a, a crosswalk, uh, and and the person in front of me has a has a like a bedazzled uh, jeans jacket, it had like all these you know sparkly things on it, and it says McCain, and I'm like I'm like that's a relative. <laughs> And I said to her, I go, oh, I love your jacket. And she turned around. And I should have recognized her immediately from Jeremy. She's in so many of his TikTok videos that I've seen. But but I said, I said, I said, are you just a big fan or are you a relative? And she said, oh, I'm his mother. And so we chatted for a little bit. She was super sweet. I think she, we're going to try and have her on the podcast at some point in the next couple of weeks. She was she and her husband were both there. And we talked a little bit about it. She said, by the way, that she loves podcasts. She was like, wait, what's your podcast? So uh, so hopefully she's going to start listening. Um I, I I don't want to be mean to her. Her son had a pretty bad game. <laughs> <laughs> She's a sweetheart. She and I chatted a little bit after the game via text. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. That was a tough one. I, if she's listening right now, then I don't want to be mean to her. But but Jared really, really struggled in this game. Just could not get his shot to go at all. And there was a moment in the first half where Jared McCain, he had like this run. He, he ran through the lane and – he ended up not having a, a good option. There wasn't anyone to pass the ball to, and he kind of ended up trying like a scoop shot. I don't even think it hit rim. It was bad. But literally, uh, he took that shot, and you saw John Shire turn to the bench and say something, and TJ Power shot up and went to the, to the bench. It was instantaneous. Like, McCain took that scoop shot, and John Shire said, he's coming out. TJ, go give it a shot. See if you can do better than that. Um I thought this was Jared McCain's worst game in a Duke uniform. I think, it, by the way, it will be his worst game ever in a Duke uniform because I think he will be better moving forward. But he really struggled. Um, yeah, Donald, like a couple weeks ago, there was like, I would hear from people, there were like some concerns. Oh, do you think McCain and Foster might might be thinking about the NBA draft? Not to say that they're never going to get drafted, but the notion at this point that they would have draft stock after the season I hope they do because it's going to mean they're playing a lot. Right now, right now, McCain and Foster, our freshman guards, are not getting it done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Gina. I'm sorry, Gina McCain. I hope you're not upset at that, but that's just the reality at the moment. You know, uh, I want to, I want to put a pin in that for a little bit later. I want to go to Mark Mitchell and the T at the end, and, and it was a great play, right? Like it's one of those things where we've had a couple of these plays that have been for lack of a better word, tainted by a technical. We had the Tyrese Proctor dunk where he he yammed on that dude and then that dude like undercut him and he told him about it. 
um, a couple couple weeks ago. And then now this one where he dunked in it, 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 look, in the heat of the moment, it looked like it was a very quick, you know, he just pointed at the defender as he, you know, right after he came down. And I don't know if he said something to him or if it was just the point. And it don't matter. It's automatic. I, I like, know it doesn't. Ma- I know it doesn't matter. But my, my point is, is like that dunk put us up four. And with just a quick, I mean, it was a, a split second of a point. It wasn't like wasn't like Sean Kemp when he dunked on dude and like pointed right at him and and the camera had to flash to him. If you if you missed if you blinked you missed the point and it becomes a technical. Georgia Tech makes two. They then take the ball and tie it up on that next possession and a four point lead disappears very very late in the ball game. Jason, from your vantage point, talk about what what you saw in the arena because I know some people again. If you blinked, you would have missed it. And I, I definitely missed it. Uh, but at the end of the day, man, that is such a backbreaker because after what it took for them to fight from, I think, as much as what, 10, 12 down to get to the point where they were taking a four point lead and it felt like, oh, we, we might escape with this one. It all comes crashing down with with one point. I, I had a great like I said, we had a great vantage point to see the point and literally the second he did it I, I was sitting next to a couple guys for the right for the duke chronicle the, and we were chatting throughout the whole game the second he pointed i said that's a t in, in the pros they let you get away with it a little bit more college mm-hmm. they, 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 there's no way and and it wasn't it wasn't subtle maybe you're right if you blink you missed it I didn't blink. I didn't miss it. <laughs> I saw it clearly. And there was mm-hmm. no, there was no question in my mind that he was going to get a T and it took the ref a second to, to sort of raise it, realize what he did. Yeah. yeah and, and, <laughs> and team up. Uh, I, I, I was, I, I mean, it was, it was a foolish play. I'm sure Mark Mitchell is incredibly upset about it and, and it doesn't go with his personality. You know, we've, um, we, we've seen enough of Mark to know that he's not that kind of player. But but it's a T, and anyone who says it's not justified, I I would, I would argue with, and Tech goes on a ten to two run from there, to 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 seal up the game. And you're right, the biggest thing was they got the two free throws, and then they get the bucket, and and essentially the lead that Duke has worked so hard to obtain goes away in one possession. Um, this will a friend of mine said to me this will forever be known as the Mark Mitchell technical game, and and he's right, and I feel terrible for Mark about that because. Mark had made some very key plays, and, and and we mentioned the plus minus. Mark Mark had a positive impact on this game for Duke, which is something hasn't happened a lot for him lately in the past few games. And uh, you know he was sent to the bench and responded by having I think a pretty good game for him until that brief moment. And by the way, uh, I'm not sure if they showed it on television. You saw him after the ref called the T. You saw him like grab his head. Yeah. Uh, Mark, yeah. He kind of, he kind of put his, like did the, the surrender Cobra essentially like, yeah, I was like, yeah. Oh man, like, what did I do? Like something like that. Um, And, and Jason, again, I, there's, I think people need to understand that because I think we got some emails about this. There's a difference between a, a, a stupid technical, right. But one that's malicious, this was not malicious, right. It wasn't like he, he meant to sit there and be like, you know, get in the dude's grill and say, yeah, I just dunked it on you. Like, I mean, he could have done a lot more like, again. If you, if you, weren't paying attention you you may not have even seen the point you were paying attention because you were in the building but it's one of those things where in the heat of the moment that happens i hate that it happened at that moment because it erased again what what we had built and worked on and and all the all the good that you know all the bad that we've talked about like would have kind of been a little bit more alleviated had we kept that four point lead but man it's 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 tough and for a guy and, and you know Mark Mitchell, it's the second game we've lost ever where he's had 10 or he's had 10 points or more, you know, sec- two games. It's also, the, I believe it's the first game short of injury that he hasn't started in his career. And so those little things where I thought he responded and had a great game, it, it, it's it's unfortunate that it happened. And Jason, before I give you the last word um, on Mark Mitchell, again, I, I want to kind of flip it again and say, like you said, coming off the bench, a role that he's not familiar with, he, I thought he did fairly well, and and it, especially on the defensive end, there was a couple of times where he had a couple of steals, a couple of blocks, uh, or at least affected the shot enough uh, to make Georgia Tech miss and us go the other way. 
I think that energy was was definitely needed. But let me give you the best, last word on the bad, and then we're going to wrap up with some uh, reactions to some of the things we got from some of the listeners. So uh, this isn't technically a bad for this game, but it's just something, a reality check for Duke fans. If you look at the advanced metrics, you know, the Bart Korvik and Ken Pomeroy, it still looks like Duke's a pretty good team. Uh, with Bart Torvik's ra- rankings, you're able to remove the preseason bias. And and I just want folks to, to be aware, uh, you know, we're currently number 19 in the Torvik rankings. When you take the preseason expectations out of the mix, Duke is number 45. Basically, to this point in the season, Duke has played like a bubble team. And, and I don't think that should come as a huge surprise to anybody. If you've been watching this team play this year, that's that's about right. Uh, but I just wanted folks to be aware of sort of where we are at the moment. By the way, if you take out preseason expectations, the number one team in Torvik's rankings is Houston, and the number two team is BYU. Purdue, I think, is uh, – sorry, Arizona's number three, and Purdue's like in the top five as well. But, you know, preseason expectations do a lot of uh, weight into these into these rankings, and I just think it's worth noting that, you know, this Duke team is a team – John Shire, you know, you heard in the comments that I, that I played from him, John Shire said – yeah, the coaches, we've got to figure some things out. The, the team has a week off here. We don't play again until next Saturday. And I know the guys are going to be studying for exams and stuff like that. It's a very important time of year for, for getting work done off the court. But I think there's some really, really important work that may be done on the court. As Because I, I think Sh- uh, what I got from Shire's press conference, as we <laughs> circle back to something 30 minutes ago, I mm-hmm. apologize is that uh, he recognizes that there, there's more going on here than, oh, Duke can't buy a three-pointer. It's really easy to, to sort of go, oh, we're not shooting well. I think Shire understands, you know, as we've talked about, uh, the game is too hard for Duke on offense and too easy for our opponents. And Shire, I, I think and I hope, this is a big test for him, big test for him. I, I think and I hope Shire is going to put some things in place to begin to fix those things. Yeah, and, and that kind of leads me to my final point. And it's not just we, we we got some emails and we get a lot of emails, which we which we really appreciate. But people with their analysis of the game, breaking things down. We also I also you know check all the forums and and just the the state of uh, of Duke fandom in general. And there's it's starting to get a little reachy with some of the commentary out there. And by that I mean. There's people who are basically saying that the sky is falling, that this team sucks, and that this team is is not what we thought it would be, and that it, and it's an indictment on the program, that it's an indictment on John Shire and the coaching staff, that it's an indictment on some of these players and, and do basketball in general in the state of where we're at. I ask everybody to pump the brakes on that just a bit. Now, what is, in my mind, what is true? This team is not what we expect it to be. That part is true. We expected this team to be doing and performing a lot better than they are right now. The reasons for some of those failures and different or or deficiencies in in some areas of our game is not an indictment on the program. It's not an indictment of some of these players. It is a simple fact, like Jason said, it is we are working really hard to try to play basketball when we shouldn't be. And some of the guys that we've relied on to be consistent have not been consistent. I've talked all year about the freshmen being uh, inconsistent and, and trying to limit that inconsistency because that's how freshmen become sophomores in, in, in the you know grand scheme of things. But the upperclassmen have been inconsistent too. And it, it's not, it, it's not shit. It's not blame on the freshmen. It's not blame on the upperclassmen. The entire team has been inconsistent and where some people find it is kind of a good thing sometimes to not know where your scoring coming from. That can be an issue when you are relying on certain people to do what they do. We are game in and game out. And I ask people to think about that. What are the, what breaking down to the point of don't worry about calling it street ball or, or hero ball or, or a lot of these, you know, negative connotations that we use to describe this team plays. The simple fact is, as Jason mentioned, Hey, we shouldn't be playing one on five. We should be playing five on five. And when we play five on five, we are better than almost every single team we are going to line up against this season. The problem is we have not been playing one on five or five on five basketball. A lot of the times it is one guy taking into the basket and trying to go up against the rest of the other team. And that is not going to end well 
game in and game out. You can get away with it sometimes. You may get a nice play out of it, a, a nice and one for the highlight reels, but it's not going to be sustainable. And I think what Duke needs to find in this week is to find where that consistency is going to come from, recognize their strengths, recognize their deficiencies, and learn how to play as this Duke basketball team, forget all the Duke basketball teams of the past, learn how this team can be successful together. I think that's what John Shire also was alluding to, Jason, in his comments, is we need to find what this team's identity is going to be. It's something that you know we've, we've heard from Duke teams all the time. Don't worry about the 2001s and the 2015s. They had their identity. What's this one? I don't know that answer yet, and I don't think this team knows that answer yet. That's what I hope they get to start searching for this week because, again, we have a week, we play Charlotte, we have another week, we play another game, and then we play Baylor in the Garden, you know, that fourth non-conference test. And then we're, again, we're right back into ACC season and off we go and running. This team needs to figure that out. And that's kind of what this part of the season is about. We never really have to do this. But even for the coaching staff is, hey, what kind of team do you want this team to be? What kind of personnel do you have? What strengths do we have? And put those guys in the best places for them to be successful. If if Ryan Young is not successful holding the ball outside the three-point line, don't give him the ball outside the three-point line. Put him in the paint where he can do the most damage, whether it be through shot or through passing. If Sean Stewart needs to come off the bench and, and be in the post or be outside, wherever that is, figure out what that is. And I think that team just hasn't done that yet. So I ask everybody to... Not necessarily relax. This is, we have a lot of concerns and those concerns are valid. But I do think that Duke basketball is going to be okay. We all have to come together and we all have to get behind this team just like we have every other one. And what, what do we say when we're in Cameron? When we're up, Cameron should be going nuts. And when we're down and we're struggling, Cameron should be even more louder than it is when we're successful because that's Amen. what it's going to take. So against uh, against Charlotte on Saturday, we're back in the friendly confines. I want everyone who's there to make sure of that. Understand that this Cameron Crazies, the people upstairs, get behind this team because when they struggle, they're going to need everyone. It takes it takes the entire team, and we're all a part of that. Donald is December third. I'm yet to see a college basketball season where the champion, the Final Four teams, the conference champion was determined by December 3rd. Yeah, I haven't seen grow, it. Teams grow, teams change, teams figure things out. And you need, it, it, look, just look back to last season. Jeremy Rich talked about this. Yeah. yeah. Duke was struggling a year ago around this time. And, and then down the stretch, come February, they were a team that no one wanted to see. We are way more experienced this year. And I think there's more depth of talent, more options this year than there were last year. So, yeah, th- things don't look great at the moment. We we've, we we've spent an hour talking about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that is that is not the final word to be written on this season. Absolutely. Now, Jason, we're, we we wrap as we always do with play of the game. Also, because we I know we had a, a very bad week of Duke basketball, but we will give out player of the week honors. But first your play of the game from yesterday against Georgia Tech. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll make it quick. I thought it was Jalen Blake's chase down block, which was just an elite defensive play. Uh, it came in a you know a moment. I forget the exact score, but it came in a moment when uh, Duke needed that kind of lift. Uh, he'd been doing it just with his perimeter defense, um, and then to do it with with his defense on a fast break like that, take away take away two points from Georgia Tech. Um, and, and to me, it was one of the great effort plays in the game. And that's just so important. I, I, it, no brainer to me. I, I didn't see anything else that came close to that. Yeah, that was mine. Um, I'll make it even in briefer. You described it perfectly. I thought that was a, a great play at a at a pivotal moment. And he was able to provide that again. A, one of those few statistical things that he does uh, that you're like, wow. Like, man, he did a chase down block. You're not expecting J- Jalen Blakes to do that. So I thought that was a really good play. And Jason, we move on to player of the week. Of course, we have the games against Arkansas and Georgia Tech to think about. Who was your player of the week? I have one, and I, maybe you have the same one, because I think there's one guy that I thought stood out among the rest. Yeah, there, there's it's a no-brainer this week. It has to be Jeremy Roach. Uh, 42 points on the week. Uh, 
plays an average of 39 minutes, but you know, 40 and 38 minutes in the two games. And in a week where Duke struggled, and I mean really struggled with it shooting all over the floor. He's a guy, he hit his free throws, he hit his three pointers. There's there's little question in my mind who the who the player of the week is. I don't I don't think anyone's up even under consideration. Yeah, I, I had Jeremy Roach, as, as you mentioned, 42 points. He only sat out two minutes and two seconds this week. Um, get that man an ice bath. Uh, but I, I, I think when it comes to Jeremy Roach, he also, again, like you said, he was efficient from the floor and, and making knocking down his free throws. Yeah, there was he, he, no one had a perfect week, but I think he was the most consistent across the week. And when I talk about consistency, I'm going to reward somebody who's very consistent across the week and you know, scoring 20 in one game and 22 in the other. That That's pretty consistent to me. So hats off to Jeremy Roach. Yeah, and you know, by the way, uh, we, we, we talked in the preseason, you know, who's going to lead this team in three-point shooting and stuff like that. Jeremy Roach on the season right now, is at almost 46% on his three-pointers. Like his true shooting percentage, which is a, a mix of of twos and threes and how that all works out, is up close to 60%. That is outrageously higher than it's ever been in his career. Uh, he's really uh, – Duke is struggling, and and you can say that, that Roach sometimes takes ill-advised shots against too many defenders, but but he's having every bit the, the season that we would have ever hoped that he would have as a senior. Absolutely. And we, we we hope it continues throughout the uh the coming days and weeks. We're gonna need that, especially again as we try to get off this two game losing streak on Saturday against Charlotte. We're gonna preview that later this week and later this week. Also, it, it's Sunday. Bowl bowl season will be announced. All the bowls will be announced today. We hope to know where Duke is gonna be playing uh by the time this comes out. So we'll talk about that on a future episode. Maybe we'll talk about a future Duke football head coach on a future episode but if you want to get the future episodes you need to stay locked with us subscribe rate review tell your friends about it again this is the dbr podcast and for jason evans i am donald wine thank you so much for listening and now it is time for the duke fan play us out and take us home